to be bringing you an evening of poetry. Uh, we're honored to have with us Peter Gizzi celebrating his new poetry collection published by Wesleyan Press. It's titled Now It's Dark. Uh, Peter Gizzi is the author of eight collections of poetry, including Archaeophonics, Threshold Songs, and In Defense of Nothing, Selected Poems, 1987 through 2011. Uh, he has published several limited edition chapbooks, folios, <laughs> artist books, and so on. Uh, he makes his home in Holyoke, Massachusetts. We're really, really honored to have him with us tonight. And joining him is none other than C.A. Conrad. C.A. Conrad has been uh, working with the ancient technologies of poetry and ritual since 1975. They are the author of Amanda Paradise, which is forthcoming from Wave Books this year. Their book, While Standing in Line for Death, won the Lambda Literary Book Award. Uh, they've also received numerous honors for their work, including a Creative Capital Grant, a Pew Fellowship, a Believer Magazine Award, and so on. They teach at Columbia University in New York City and Sandberg Art Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that we will be posting links in the chat function that's activated mm -hmm. by a button at the bottom of your dashboard. You can uh, purchase copies of both Peter and CA's books uh, through the chat function. Um, also, I encourage everyone to switch to speaker view to really get a better view of the authors as they speak. So that function is also activated by a little tab at the top of right corner of your screen. So it is such a delight to have you both with us. Um, now, CA, you've read with us before, but Peter, I think this is your first time at City Lights, albeit virtually. So really a great honor to have you both with us today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Peter. Yep. Appreciate it. Um, can you guys hear me? Can you see me? I don't know what's happening. All I see, all I see are books. Um, it looks great, Peter. Oh, you can see me because yeah, I can you look good, okay. Peter. We can see you. All right. Well, welcome to my space station here in Western Massachusetts. I don't know what to tell you. Um, it's been a long winter. It's about five degrees outside. Big moon. So. I'm really happy to do this with CA. I'm very happy to do this through City Lights, um, a bookstore that I visited all the time when I lived in Santa Cruz. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read, I guess the way the evening's gonna work is I'm gonna read, then CA and I are gonna talk, and then I'm gonna read another poem or two, then we're gonna talk, and then I'm gonna close with a poem. So that's the, that's the order of events. And I'm gonna begin with the first poem in the book, uh, Speech Acts for a Dying World, and I hadn't been writing for a while, um, for a long while, and was kind of thinking maybe it was done. And then when I began to write this poem, I began to realize that I was on my way into a book. Speech acts for a dying world. A field sparrow is at my window tapping at its reflection, a tired antique god trying to communicate it's getting to me as I set out to sing the nimbus of flora under a partly mottled sky. As I look at the end and sing, so what? Sing, live now, thinking, why not? I'm listening and receiving now, and it feeds me. I'm always hungry when the beautiful is too much to carry inside my winter, when my library is full of loss, full of wonder as the polis is breaking and casts a shadow over all of me, thinking of it. When the shadows fall in ripples, when the medium I work in is deathless and I'm living inside one great example of stubbornness, as my head is stove in by a glance, as the day's silver tip buds sway in union, waving to the corporate sky. When I said work and meant lyric, when I thought I was done with a poem as a vehicle to understand violence. I thought I was done with a high tone shitty world, done with a voice and its constituent pap. Call down the inherited phenomenal world when it's raining in the book, lost to the world in an abundance of world. Like listening to a violin when the figure isn't native, but the emotion is. When everything is snow, and what lies ahead is a mesmer's twirling locket. I thought I was done with the marvel of ephemeral shadow play, the great design and all that. 
I thought I was done with time, its theatricality, glamour, and guff. Gusting cloud, I see you, I become you in my solitary thinging, here in partial light. When I said voice, I meant the whole unholy grain of it. It felt like paradise. Meaning rises and sets, now a hunter overhead, now a bear at the pole, and the sound of names, the parade of names. Next poem, it's a street where I walk every day. That I saw the light on Nonatuck Avenue that every musical note is a flame native in its own tongue, that between bread and ash there is fire, that the day swells and crests, that I found myself born into it with sirens and trucks going by out here in a poem, that there are other things that go into poems like the pigeon, cobalt, dirty windows, sun, that I have seen skin in marble, eye in stone, that the information I carry is mostly bacterial, that I am a host, that the ghost of the text is unknown, that I live near an Air Force base and the sound in the sky is death, that sound like old poetry can kill us, that there are small things in the poem, paper clips, gauze, tater tots, and knives, that there can also be emptiness fanning out into breakfast rolls, macadam, stars, that I am hungry, that I seek knowledge of the ancient sycamore that also lives in the valley where I live, that I call to it, that there are airships overhead, that I live alone in my head out here in a poem near a magical tree, that I saw the light on Nonatuck Avenue and heard the cry of a dove recede into a rustle, that its cry was quiet light falling into a coffin, that it altered me, that today the river is a camera obscura bending trees, that I sing this of metallic shimmer, sing the sky, the song, all of it, and wonder if I am dying, would you come back for me? <clears throat> inside out loud and then the day became fat burned beyond description the why waste a day with description better to say why waste the poem with trumpets better to say lilac to say war the room i live in the collapse of interiority happened in my time. In my time, I was a bewildered subject, a ghost hungry for selfhood. I was walking and talking. I thought of you. I think of you, ghost. It's impossible to see the flight against the void I come from inside the extremes where I really lived. The other me hidden and darker, I kept my language closer, these redacted documents inside. Writing is one thing, pain is the same thing. I am a stranger in this. I use the words haunted in life because you can see them, but it's more like spinning light in a dark room, a catastrophic light. I have seen it before, but if there's a way forward, I've yet to find it. I will sigh at winter psychodrama of wind. There is a green sward inside, a reclamation in small things. There is a hill, and on this hill, I see another hill. The bridges were a natural iron, ferns bowed in the gale, leaves came to ground. What wind brought me, wanting to see the truth in green? Sequestered here, there is a purpose, there is a density to sight. To see is an organic thing. Sunday was like this, an unwavering, lively occurring, stupefied and restless. And then one more short one. <clears throat> the present is constant elegy. Those years when I was alive, I live the era of the fast car, 
There were silhouettes in gold and royal blue, a half light in tire marks across a field, times when the hollyhocks spoke. There were weeds in a hopescape, as in a painted backdrop, there is also a face. And then I found myself when the poem wanted me in pain writing this. The sky was always there, but useless. And what of the blue flocks <clears throat> on stage and morphing? Chance blossoms so quickly. It's a wonder we recognize anything, wanting one love to walk out of the ground. Passion comes from a difficult world. I'm sick of twilight when the light is crushed. Time unravels its string. Along the way, I discovered a voice, a sun-stroked path choked with old light, a ray already blown. Look at the world, its veil. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. There we go. I can see you. Good. <laughs> I see it. Peter, that was amazing. Thank you. It was such a good reading. And you're going to read a couple more times for us. I hope so. Yeah. That's the plan. Now, I have a few specific questions about some of the work you just read. Okay. And I'd rather start with the overall construction of the book. And I would, could you talk about the four sections that you have there? Let's... Sure. Um, the book's broken into these <clears throat> four movements. I think of it like, I mean, it's not that radical, like a quartet um, with four movements. And um, the first, first section's called Lyric, and the poems I read were from that section, and they are what they are. And then the second section is called Garland, and it has a 30-page poem called Marigold and Cable, which is a kind of fugue. It, it, um, they keep picking up lines as they go, like the last line to the first line, but it's not that regimented. They're not the exact lines. I just use the vocabulary, but it's like, it's a braided loop piece. And I wrote it, um, a really lovely composer, a young guy in Cincinnati named Alex Cobb had a label called Students of Decay. And he did a lot of records of ambient and loop music and uh, a record of his, a composition of his was gonna come out from a label in uh, Germany. And he said, if I wrote a poem to it, they would publish a little limited chapbook to go with the, with the first editions. And so I sat and listened to this loop music and then that's where I got the form. And so, and that poem really deals with light. You know, it's, it's really, it's like, cause the book is called Now It's Dark. And so it was really nice to have something that was a kind of relief. Cause then I go into a poem called Knock, I mean, ship of state and that's the third section which is called nocturne and um that's a very dark poem about being a corpse just kind of the way i don't want yeah which is what we all are under commercial governance and uh and then the last section is just a coda you know it's like a recapitulation of many of the ideas and things that are in the book um so there's no, there's no title page. It's just, I mean, there's no contents page. There's just these four sections. And I mean them to be discreet and also have an, their own integrity. Um, but I could say more, but did you have another question? You actually now have answered a question that I was gonna ask you later on about section two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And could you tell us a little more about this? So you actually wrote that uh, to go with the music. The music was already there. Yeah, it was like an ambient loop music, very atmospheric. And I just put it on, on repeat and I just listened to it for hours and I just began to draft. And then I began to pick up lines and then I, the form kind of came to me. And it took me about a month to write. And then it took me about, I mean, he published it in one form. Then it took me like a year later, I looked at it and then it took me some time to revise it. Cause I tend to like, this is, this is the good part of writing to me is when I get a draft, a solid draft, and then I let it sit and then I can get back up inside it and really begin to, you know, craft it, hone it. I don't know about craft it, but just bring it out. And often for me, bringing out, making the poem come to life is by taking things away. And what I'm taking away is my intention and what I'm trying to reveal is what the poem wants to make something bigger than me. Because, I mean, in the end, I guess, Writing has many side effects, but 
the one for me that I've really begun to discover in the last decade is that what I'm really creating is my personhood. Um, I'm creating this fiction, this voice, and this voice has something to do with me, but it's also much bigger than me. I know that I use the pronoun I, but to me, I is a fiction. It's a character. It's it's bigger than me. It's older than me. It doesn't live. I, I, it doesn't live in me. I live in it. We all do. And it's just wound with all these affiliated voices, and it's wound with so much consciousness. And it's and so to me, the I is like I've always favored the I. But if, when I was younger, it was closer to me. As I've gone on, it's become further and further away from me. And um, yeah, that's just. But what? But the aside is is that. What I'm building is a kind of way to see reality. And I think we all do as writers as we write through our lives. And what we build in that voice, I think for me, is my personhood, you know? I was so glad that you read the opening poem, Speech Acts for a Dying World. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you something specific about that. Yeah, go but before I do it, my little disclaimer is, you know that I would never ask you a question to specifically explain a line. I'm not into exegesis, so I'm not going to do that. Right. However, on page five, where are we at? Yeah, where's this up? When I thought I was done with the poem as a vehicle to understand violence. Mm -hmm. Now I'm asking you to explain it. What I'm interested in is the, the inside of that stanza you let us know that there was a time in the past where you mm -hmm. said, okay, this is my level. Mm -hmm. I've had enough. Mm -hmm. That's what was that? Well, like, okay. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I didn't write for about nine months. Uh, Archaeophonic came out in the fall of 2016. And we remember the fall of 2016 was the beginning of the end. And uh, mm -hmm. So the book's called Now It's Dark. I mean, it's darker now, but um, it's been dark for a long time. I mean, poets have been writing through one rotten kingdom after another. We've been here for a long time. I mean, for as long as there's been soldiers, there's been poets. And it's like this long, sad, venerable tradition. And I'm just a piece of that. We all are. And um, but so I hadn't been writing. I kind of thought maybe I'm done. You know, I thought I actually you know I. I Part of my operating system is despair and so I was despairing and um, and so when I began that poem as a kind of invocation and in this the, this this occasion to begin like singing again um, I was you know I was going through all these different machinations of that and so when I came to that line you know, I thought I was done, but the poem is, it's like, it's like Beckett's, I can't go on, I must go on. And so once again, I find myself back in a poem. Once again, I find myself back in the world. Once again, I find myself back in a broken world. And so, and, and then I'm not done. We got to keep, like, this is also part of the poem. I mean, syntax connects me sadly to Donald Trump, but it also connects me to some of the great majesties of, you know, the world. But um, so that, I think that's where it was at. And I'm grateful for that poem because it's like, okay, I can get going again. And so much of this book actually, as you know, CA is, is about poetry and death. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's about, um, I mean, yeah. The death part is the dark part, what was happening politically. And then the other piece of it was that during the writing of this book, my older brother, Tom, um, got sick with ALS and so I took care of him and that was a really sad trip that only goes the one way and I don't wish it upon anyone and I don't wish it upon anyone to caretake that um, but what's amazing is is that about poetry in my life again these side effects is that it was there for me you know it was there for me in that moment to write and I feel, and I don't write autobiographically. Again, I talked about the eyes of fiction. I don't write confessional verse. There's some moments where biography touches, but it doesn't, it doesn't overtake the poem. It's just, it's just one register am, among many registers. But so that was also a piece of that went into this book. Yeah. Um, 
So your last two previous books, Archaeophonics and Threshold Songs, Threshold Songs sort of begins this, I mean, you, you've written um, elegiac poems before, but this is, this is very different, mm -hmm. this, this new one, like Threshold Songs and then Archaeophonics sort of bring us into this uh, sweeping elegy that you've been part of, but this book has a whole different, uh, demeanor to it mm. and I think um I feel like sometimes elegy is taken lightly uh, yeah. for some people and I don't feel like elegy is a form it's a state of being that the poet needs to have come from and be in and I feel like with this book in particular with um that section that second section you do something that is completely unique should we just get into this now because i was going to save this part for later but... no just we're here let's do it let's do it can i smoke is that going to be okay for everybody all right i, I think so yeah go for it <laughs> yeah. so when i okay so when i first got the book mm -hmm. i um i was looking at it and when you look when you look you physically you know see those poems in the section second section they they seem so not out of place, but very different. And now you've just explained how you wrote them and why you wrote them, which I had no idea that that was going to be the answer any more than I had any idea that your answer about the question about violence as a vehicle was going to be. That was kind of extraordinary. But there's something that happens when we look at that. And so years ago, I was invited by this magazine to write book reviews. And I said, well, all right, we'll, we'll give it a shot. I don't know. And by, I said, but I will only review poetry books. And we're like, what? I was like, no, no novels, get out of here, just poetry. And um, so they were annoyed with that. But then I said, okay, I only wanna review poetry books through poetry as, like soup. If poetry were soup, you know, each book of poetry is a different recipe, it tastes a certain way. Mm -hmm. Maybe I like it, maybe it would give you gas. I don't know, it's none of my business. But then there's also soil, reptiles. I didn't like poetry as reptiles, mm. but I was thinking for your book, poetry as fabric. Mm. Nice. And the fabric I came up with when I, when I got, cause I, I put that in mind while I was like reading it the second time. I was like, what fabric is this? And I think it's two fabrics, one on either side. Mm. The one side is silk and the other side is sandpaper. I know some people out there would say, well, sandpaper is not a fabric. Yes, it is. It's Anything can be fabric. It's a, it's a texture, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. chocolate can be fabric if you have the right company. <laughs> so the rough, the rough and the smooth, this is, the, this is life. I remember early on when I was changing my habits in my late twenties, you know, when I left New York, and this person who was helping me change my habits um, said to me, and I always love, I'll never forget this. He said, look, you're trying to figure it all out at once. He said, your job is to stand behind the tapestry and they're gonna pass the needle through. Your job is to pull it taut and pass it back through. And he said, the design is none of your business. The design is no one's. And, and, I, and, I, and I like that idea of fabric. I like the idea that I can't figure it all out at once, and it comes in it comes in small moments of you know awakening, small moments of you know, um, yeah, um, understanding, and so I, I always like that as a way that you know I go from one thing to the next, and each one leads me a little further along, and and I like the fact that you talk about the, these last three books, Threshold Songs, Archaeophonics, and now it's dark because. They were kind of trilogy. I would love to move on from elegy. I don't know if it's possible. It happens to be my soul. I, I mean, Wallace Stevens um, said, pardon the pronoun, he said, the problem of the poet is the problem of his mind and nerves. And I think that my mind and nerves were formed very young from the story of my early life. And um, so, yeah, so each poem takes me further and open. It's just, it's like a dilation. It just, I, I just, I just want to open more and more and let the poem come to me let the language come to me in the beginning i was loud and 
the lovely thing about doing this is that they've turned the volume up, just keeps getting louder in the world. And my job is just to listen and receive, you know, and I like that position. It feels better. And from that, I have discovery, you know, discovery of expression, discovery of emotional reality. And, um, and then again, this developing notion of, 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 of a person, of a being that the voice creates. So I do think of them as a trilogy, um, but where I go from here, I don't know. I, I don't know about you. I always think my, yeah, I always think I have to, you know, I have to get writing. I have a new poem, but I have to get writing again because I always feel like when I publish a book, it's my last book, you know. Again, it's just my, my operating system. It tends to despair. Um, it's just how it goes. I'm a fatalist, but I, it's useful. I think doubt's a useful way to construct reality. I think not knowing too is another way in my poems, there's, off, there's, there's a lot of turning, you know, and I think that not knowing for me is an honest way to try to find meaning in the world because I would, because when you open, you take in the world and its instabilities, its instabilities in language of expression, but you just take in the instabilities of the horrors that are around you and also the glories that are around you. And I think the poem, use the word fabric, can weave all of these things together in a single speech act. You know, it's not just this, it's not that. And, and I've never really been like a, a, a poet who's like a trumpet or a bang a can. I mean, I think politics touches in the political reality we live in touches all of our lives, but so many things touch our lives. And so I don't think the poem needs to be about one thing. I like it when it's braided and it's about many things at once. Should I read a poem that kind of does that? Do you mind if we talk a little more about the fabric for one second, though? No, go for before it. We do that? No, yeah. It's going to, okay. I'm going to tell you why silk. Okay. And it's going to sound awful for a second, but just hang in there. <laughs> okay. Um, silk. It's one of the most tragic. It is just, it is like, it is the fabric of elegy. Mm. And it takes about 3,000 silkworms, the lives of 3,000 silkworms to make one pound of silk. They have to murder 3,000 silkworms in their cocoons. And they're just about to open up and with their wings for the first time and fly, and they're murdered in their sleep, you know? So it's just got this fabric. And if you've got silk bed sheets at home you're on right now, just remember you're sleeping on a graveyard. <laughs> the thing is about it, and I don't go around like weighing people's bed sheets. But I'm guaranteeing you it's about three to 6,000 worms, you know what I mean? Wow. And, um, but the thing about that is the worms, like in going into this idea of poetry as fabric. Um, <clears throat> I, I like so, that, I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I think there's more beauty and sorrow than there is sorrow and beauty. Um, I do think that, yeah, I mean, I, I think that beautiful things are born out of hard reality. You know. It's the second section of the book that makes me say silk, though. Right. Okay. Because, you know, when I think about uh, people like Nikola Tesla, Tesla had this way of talking about how you can frame everything in the world with these three ideas of energy, frequency, and vibration. Mm -hmm. And I feel like elegy always takes on those three things simultaneously. And with this book, the opening section is definitely the energy. There's the body the death, the, the, you're talking about your brother in just like very beautiful and sad way. It's like all there, you're giving us all that. By the time we get to that second section, I'm glad you explained what you were doing with that because I was imagining you like in a forest, like singing to the trees or something. Well, you music, literally do but, this. But music can do that. Like when you get lost inside a piece of music, like I put music on you know, if, if I put on, you know, piano music, it kind of turns my living room into a cathedral. You know, I, I think that music can definitely transform space, hence maybe why we're interested in poetry, because that's a really profound form of music and it can transform space, you know. It creates a space, you know, you can live in it. At least I do. Um, but that second section is the vibration. Mm. It's the frequency, I mean. So okay. it's like, excuse me, the frequency. So it's like, that is, the, that is the moment where we as the reader, we kind of like take off with what you're doing, the things that you gave us with part one. Suddenly it's like, we're feeling that it's like the most visceral part of the book in a way. 
Wow. You would think maybe the late, the third section would be, but for me, that second section was like, we're engaged. It was like this choir of angels you brought to us. And it would roll. The way it rolls is beautiful. It's like the tide rolling in and leaving a little poem behind and then you read it just enough time for the next wave to come in. That's nice. I like that. I mean, I like the idea of a wave because I think that meaning is always, I mean, I'm interested in my poems by iteration and litany is that meaning is always cresting. And if you can ask the question or put put an idea out there, you don't have to, you don't have to answer it. You can keep going with another question or another supposition. And that meaning is always cresting. I'm very much interested in meaning always cresting, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you like that section because that's one of those poems that I wrote that, you know, when Robert Browning was asked about a poem, he said somebody asked him about his poem you know what it meant and he said I don't know he said when I wrote it only God and I understood and he said now only God understands <laughs> so it's like you know it's like one of those that poem I couldn't break it down for you but um I'm going to read the title poem where autobiography touches but doesn't shatter the surface um I'm going to read two poems and the second one I'm, gonna read, cause I'm just going to pick up on this idea of paper in these two paper. <clears throat> now it's dark. Not the easiest day I'm having, clouds banking, and I drop my signal. I was trying to find my shoes and thought, I am overpowered by the gigantism of commercial governing. As I look for my shoes this morning, the thought was, where am I going? There isn't a place I can walk out from under this chemical sky. So I thought I would write a poem I thought I would try and make art, but the chemicals seep into everything. Reader, if I could, I would bring back for you a sun made in crayon, a sun unformed in the paper sky. I wonder the paper that made me. Being human, I know that paper makes my mind. Strange pulp reminding me I am far away. When my brother could no longer speak, I said, Tommy, I got this. Even if I don't want this, I'll sing for you. When my brother had no voice, there was only the couch and a wooden floor, the ceiling and the TV with nothing blaring. When my brother lost his voice, I lost my childhood, lost the sun over sand in some place I can't remember in Rhode Island summer. So far from myself in a body I can't remember. To no longer remember my body as a child, to no longer remember today all that was. Van Gogh was tormented by the sun, and why not? A constant blade searing light that kills and cures. I am not comforted by the cold stability of universal laws, though one day I'll die and think, that's okay. At least I'm writing, and it makes a party in the dark, a zombie feature that connects me to the undying. I read every moment as an opportunity for grace and think, Every moment is a possibility of art. I tie my shoes and now I'm standing alone in some inky light. Yesterday I passed a budget motel next to the People's Bank. If there's some connection, it's lost on me. My heart lost on me. Weather like thought dissolves into static, a wiggy keepsake like nesting dolls of my spiritual blank, sky opening into blank. I thought grief is a form of grace. Then someone said the thing about money is that it's money. I live on the edge of an expanding circumference alone in some inky light. Now rain turns the world to constant applause. The day is uncoupled. All there is is thunder as the house decays into a sound like me. Freezing rain with silver seems to be speaking and isn't asking me anything, just doing its thing in the gray morning. I was down with materialism but wanted mystery. I've asked myself a lot of questions like why the days cascade, swiping left for life, right for lost. All of it a dumb show, all of me invested in poetry and the arrogance of this, wanting to transpose loneliness. Why not take on the next life with its silence? On my desk, there are small plastic creatures. The light on them is unrealistic. It uncouples me 
or the sight of serious windows opening out onto serious lawns. This must be a government building. This must be the anodyne room of a hospital beeping, every pronouncement on the feed alien. I'm in this corridor, wandering a mind. But the day is past caring. The rhythmus is blooming at the beginning of the way back when. I am sick with tradition and its weak signaling. Sparkling eclogues drift and contribute little to the cause. I am an incident trapped in thick description. Just Google it. Dust jackets show some rubbing near fine and cloth. And then I'm gonna read this other one um, that's next to it called Out of the World in Real Time. The silence in this room is causing a looping effect. All I see is wood grain and air when it's raining in the true north of the poem. It gives purchase to the page. It gives courage. I want to tell you this isn't just all song. I want to say this scrap of paper has sky in it to be lost in its yester glow, casting shadows upon a silent H, H for hour and honor, honest and air, also ghost, ghastly, ghetto, etc. Who knew such light could come from torn paper? What comes first, flag or paper, voting or votive? There are distances, the whole archival light blooming. I recast words to say everything touched by light remembers that light. To recast light that touched marble strewn from time, laying among weeds and trash, worn from human traffic and ordinary songs. In my head, a flywheel unable to power anything other than song. And all that's left is survival, some old piece of parchment flapping in the gale. The oak creaks and the air is keening. That green light could only be oxygen. I am witness, a copy of rain in June, a glinting vowel. Oh. Those are two from the middle of that section. Yeah. Paper keeps That is better up. than the first reading you just gave. It was <laughs> a little applause thing. I like this little applause button. Yeah. Um, it's pretty lonely out here in my space station, so thank you. <laughs> I feel like a crazy person talking to a computer, but I'm glad you're there. Um, did you have another question? Yeah, go ahead. I would like you to request, could you read page, my, my favorite page from, uh, I mean, it's such a tiny thing. Oh, I need to All look right. at your book, not my book. It's page 63. It's right in the middle of the garland. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read the page before it, that page, and the page after, so people get a taste of how it works. Yeah. Could you, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Rust in elegy on the stoop, the far candle gutters. Oak clock, your music is unwritten, even if on heavy days the bright systems sing smeared gold. These sonic systems smeared golden, a blank wall opening, and forward the hencock, bright comedy of grain, incipients cried the dove and all of the skeleton. The dove cries alpha through her scales, throws an indignant vowel. One might find hair falling, pitiless verse, a mind at rest, flawed in falling dust. And it just keeps going, yeah. See, that's what I mean about the idea of the energy, the frequency, and the vibration. Right. That's the moment where it really clicked in like that right. with me. So like you give us the energy in part one. Part two is the actual frequency. Nice. And then where the vibration, you're putting it into us in that section. And um, I feel it the most in particular with that, nice. the skeleton, the corpses are there. And, but, but there's something I wouldn't use the word optimistic, but you persist. It's persist. like, I refuse to do anything but kind of feeling. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, I don't know. Poetry for me is, it's like, it's, it's like, you know, I don't, salvation's too strong a word because it's got too many connotations. Maybe it's salvage, but it's, it's powered me, you know, it's, it's helped me go on because, you know, the world is, just so broken, you know? And I think that like poetry or elegy 
for me is like when I was younger, it transformed a broken heart in a fierce world into a fierce heart in a broken world. So it's given me a voice to be able to speak in to, you know, the condition and the unstable realities of, uh, you know, the forces of darkness. So, but yeah, I'm glad you like that poem. Yeah. I want to back up to page five again. Okay. Because, okay, so I asked you about, again, I'm not doing exegesis, we're not doing that. But I just, okay, so you, we, we, you know, when I thought I was done with the poem as a vehicle mm -hmm. to understand violence, mm -hmm. just before that, those two lines, when I said work and meant lyric. Yeah. I'm not asking you to explain it, just expand on that. Well, uh, I think poetry is a great labor. Um, and the more I've done it, the more I see that I'm part of all of these affiliated voices. And so when I said work, because the, the line before is waving to the corporate sky. So when we think of work, we think of day jobs and things. But when I said work, I meant lyric, that the lyric has this important role to play in the human record. I mean, I, I mean, I'm interested in poetry. It's my entire life. And so to me, I think that poetry is one of the most resonant ways that we have to understand the human record. And it's a serious work and it's an important work. It's a real work. And, you know, I'm interested in a lyric of reality, you know? And so, I don't know, if, if I've been given voice by my reading practice and poets before me and around me and younger than me, it's like, uh, it's, 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 it's just, it's a majesty, you know? It's uh, given me a way to survive, you know? And maybe I live by a really, you know, maybe, <clears throat> I don't know, I ask myself this question. It's like, maybe I ask too much from the poem to answer the questions of life. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's too big a demand to make on the poem, but that's, that's the drama for me. And then the other silly drama I've had, I have is I'm only as good as my next poem. So that keeps me writing and keeps, keeps me pushing forward. But yeah. So, but yeah, that's, that's how I can expand on that line. You know, you know, I did not ask you this ahead of time, but I'm just going to ask it now to see if maybe you'll say yes. That brand new poem of yours, could you read that for us? I don't have it. I don't have it with me. I don't. Oh, I have it here on my computer screen, <laughs> I think. Wait, I don't know if I can. No, no, I, I have I have another version, please. I, I have it here somewhere. Don't do this to me. Oh, okay. well, um, you, can, you can just say no, but I'd rather. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to pause on that. I, li I like it. That poem is called Fine Spot Unknown. And that's the thing that they hang in museums when there's an antiquity that they don't know where it came from. And I thought that oh, that yeah. was, I don't know, like maybe I'd like, the reason I don't want to read is because I, I want to write more of them. Like, I think it's a really useful uh, jumping off. Like, I think maybe, maybe I'm starting up again in that concept I need to an un, of, 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 of an un, unknown origin is interesting to me. I think I can, I think, that's a big enough question. You know, like that's another drama of being a writer is that, you know, can you find a way, can you find ideas that are large enough to keep you, you know, that horizon that keep, you can keep walking into and keep writing into. So the fine spot unknown to me seems like a, um, yeah, it's generative. I don't know, I'm interested. So I guess I'm cautious about sharing it just yet. Okay. Yeah. I'm not walking away. I just got a cramp in my leg and I'm standing up. It happened. So, um, <laughs> don't mind me. Um, okay, I want to bring up something else then. Okay, the, we're almost running new. out of time too. Yeah, go ahead. Bring okay, fine. okay. Yeah. I'll ask this and maybe you'll read a little more if you want. I'll close Could with the Please tell us about the, um, the book coming out from NYRB. Oh so, yeah, so um, NYRB Poetry, um, uh, series is going, we're going to reprint in April, we're doing a single new edition of After Lorca, of Spicer's After Lorca, because it's such a wonderful book, such an important book, such a great book, and asks so many questions, you know, and the one question that it asks, it's always fascinating, is who is speaking in a poem, a really good question, and that's a big, and that's a big question you can live your life in, and Spicer's always been important, and he's just, yeah, I just keep coming back to him, 
and I was really happy to do this. Uh, I found writing yet again on Spicer, the introduction was difficult, but um, I'm very happy about that. Yeah, I really like the, I mean, he's brilliant, Edwin Frank, the editor of this, of the entire New York Review of Books series. I mean, it's just an astounding work that comes out of one man's mind. It's, it's, it's remarkable. So I'm very happy that um, he wanted to do this. And I did another book with him too. I did a book by Jeremy Prin, J.H. Prin, an early book of his, The White Stones. And uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward. To, I'm looking forward to that. I think people will enjoy it, you know. Oh, yeah. And the book Can you was, tell us something the book, that, of course, is, de oh. is dedicated to Kevin Killian. That, that edition will be dedicated to Kevin. I think that's beautiful. My great, my great, you know, brother and Spicer. I mean, among many other things, but yeah, we shared that. Yeah. What were you gonna say? Oh, that's okay. Was there something in writing the introduction to that, you know, rereading it, that you saw anew, something completely different? Yeah, there are. There are. There, I got to say a few things that. I, you know, I wanted to say that I hadn't said before, or maybe I've said them in talks, but I finally got to lay it out and put it down. So that felt good. And that has to do with his relationship to Dickinson and the borderless nature between letter and poem. And yeah, you'll see when you read the introduction. Um, this has been really lovely. Um, I really appreciate people tuning in. Um, I'm grateful for that, for you listening. I'm grateful for so many of you and the work that you make are making. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the last poem in the book, which is the coda. And uh, it's another bright title. It's called, <clears throat> get some water. I should really quit smoking. <clears throat> I did quit for seven months during the lockdown. And then I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna smoke. Um, okay. This is the last poem I wrote. From this end of sadness, a particular blur attended my mind from end to end, these feelings of futurelessness, to free fall into it. It feels like winter, the light overcast and the day lit up from within. To find a line in it, I found a world torched into renewal, blackened stalks pointing skyward. I took fortification from goneness. At this end, the notation is green. No stopping music entering air and tearing air. The songs were old songs. They came with the wren and the robin, also the crow so dear to reality and elegy and traffic, its essential din, the synesthesia of the din. From this end of sadness, I identified the voice as dead. It was companionable. I identified sky turning topaz. I did not understand shadows, did not understand luminosity. I did not understand the code that held me to the world. From this end, glistening leaves, cool air, wandering out into it, wandering through it. The day crumbles to dust inside a dahlia. I am that dust in dahlia. I am coeval with the rotting trunk and the pine needles regenerating soil. I am happiest with a forest floor, branches listing under a porcelain sky. I'm into that medieval light glancing through leaves. The tree's arches are a great kingdom now. From this end of sadness, there's nothing out there I want and wonder if there's anything in here I need. I'm into the way the technology of an eye is filled with the dead. I'm heavy with light when the old sun is speaking, when I'm not sure the day is real, when it's hard to be in it and of it, to be here with it and under it. From this end of sadness, shapes come, all the boldest shadows. From this end, animals, the oldest eyes, the cri de cour, afternoons hung with seeping light. Poor sun waiting to die, poor sun solo in space, fueling our heads, a tiny sun in the mind. Right now, a particle decays on the lawn. From this end, gravity decays in the mind. To never forget the corners and dust bunnies of the laughing sun. But if the song weren't a bright star hanging in the firmament, then what can be said for burning embers in the fire? I see you turning and bending there in the cold dream of the past, braiding with the now of blur. Blur with me when I am sick of dying, fearful of failing the song I love. Be with me whenever I sit 
wasting days comfort the hours. Yes, blur with me. Blur with me, yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. I guess it's, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I wrote, I finished that poem and then the next day my brother died. Don't ask me. And then the book was done. So, I mean, besides like tweaking and revising, things like that, but yeah. Um, so I guess we've done it. I'm really happy that we got to do this together, CA. Me, I'm honored. It was wonderful. You're a good, you're a good friend. Yeah. And um, everyone else. And support City Lights Bookshop. Yeah, totally support City Lights Bookshop. And um, Barnes Robin, Spring and Getty's about to be 102. You know, it's great. You know, yeah. thank you both. This was really magnificent. And, and I just come away from it feeling like I've had a very rich meal on a cold night. Um, wonderful 